very varied in colours. And if you have a paint box, you only have probably two reds, we'll say. Uh, with pastels, you can get a much greater variety of colours. Sid was born on the 9th of January 1926 in Harburn, Birmingham, to parents William and Lottie Mae Walker. Sid was her second child, and along with brother Laurie, the family lived in Bourneville, a small town located just outside Birmingham. Sid's parents both worked at the Cadbury factory, and it was there that they met. William was a chocolate maker, carrying out the technique taught to him by George Cadbury himself and Lottie May hand-decorated the chocolates until she and William were wed, when under company policy she was no longer allowed to work. Sid's grandfather was an engine driver, a job that captivated the young boy's imagination, and he would frequently join his grandpa in the engine cabin, immediately becoming the envy of his school friends. Sid had always possessed a passion for art, and with words of encouragement from his family, he was keen to pursue it as a career. The world, however, had something different in mind. With Britain now at war, Sid was desperate to help the war effort. While still at school, he volunteered as an air raid warden with dreams of one day piloting Spitfires. However, it would be below ground where Sid would do his part. Towards the end of 1943, when I was near my 18th birthday, I received the brown envelope which meant that I had to register for war service. However, a situation had developed during 1943 which was causing grave concern for the government, a shortage of coal. Thus it was that Ernest Bevan, the Minister of Labour, appealed on the radio to men who had left the pits to return. We want young men particularly those between 18 and 25, and older men as well, if they're sufficiently fit to volunteer to go into the mine. I, mean, I imagined I'd be a Spitfire pilot or something like that, but my batch was the first one to be balloted. Every man who registered had a number, and the, the last number in his digit, however many it was, would be what the one that they would be balloted by. So it was his secretary who drew a ticket out of his hat, no one to ten, out of his bowler hat. And uh, every time they would say that the ballot this time was number two, so you looked at your thing, you said, oh, that's me, I'm going down the pits. You were told to go to a pit for training and you had your documents just as though you were in the army going to a barrack somewhere. Time was divided by being down the pit doing physical exercise and it was Churchill who said that we were trained the same as the paratroopers and the commandos because we had all these sorts of very strenuous things and this was to toughen you all up. I mean, up to then I'd been pushing a pen. So we were trained for four weeks and then that was supposed to have got us ready for being sent to a pit. You had two weeks training on the surface and then you went underground. Bevan had said, the son of the working class and the son of the Lord shall not be exempt. Everybody has to go. Some people didn't want to go and they, they decided on prison. I suppose that I looked at it in a philosophical way. I just thought, well, if this is what, what they want me to do to win the war, if they'd said, oh, you go into the submarines, I'd have been going to go into submarines. If it had been anything else, I would have done what I was told. Today, for the very first time, come the Bevan boys, who were 
conscripted for national service in the coal mines during the Second World War when Ernest Bevin was the Minister of Labour and National Service. With the war over, Sid continued his education, studying painting, illustration and latterly pottery at Ruskin Hall and Birmingham College of Art and Design. Upon graduating, he taught art in schools across England and Scotland, travelling up and down the country. On one of his trips to London, Sid met a young woman named Elizabeth and promptly declared that he'd just met the woman he was going to marry. In March 1954, Sid proposed and on Christmas Day the very same year, Sid and Elizabeth were wed. With housing scarce, the couple relocated to Birmingham, where they lived in a caravan while Sid continued to teach. After two years, Sid decided to give up teaching, and with Elizabeth in tow, the pair moved to her hometown of Montrose. It didn't take Sid long to fall in love with the small coastal town and its surrounding area, and it was here that their first child, Fiona, was born. With Sid retired from teaching, he now needed a way to provide income for his family. With this in mind, Sid embarked on a project that would either be his greatest success or his greatest failure. In 1957, Sid established the Angus Pottery, a small shop on the corner of Bridge Street in Montrose. From here, Sid would create all manners of pots, plates, jugs and other handmade items. The pottery quickly became a family affair, with Elizabeth in charge of running the shop and Fiona helping to close up each night soon joined by second daughter, Kirsten. Creating much of his work in his shop window, it wasn't uncommon for crowds to gather outside to watch the potter in action. After a while, it wasn't just the locals who took notice, and soon Sid was the feature of many magazines and lifestyle articles. When questioned by one journalist as to why he would leave a salaried position, Sid replied, the whole point about salary is that you will get that sum and no more, whereas this has all the fascination of fishing. It might be a perch, or it might be a salmon. Five pounds or five thousand. Who knows? By 1968, business was flourishing, attracting custom from all over the world. It looked like nothing could stop the potter in his tracks. On the 1st of May 1968, while Sid was on his way to the pottery, an articulated lorry carrying steel girders jackknifed into the building, completely destroying it alongside all of its contents. Sid and Fiona had been held up on their journey to the shop and so arrived moments after the accident, a coincidence that inadvertently saved their lives. Although luckily no one was harmed, in an instant Sid lost his entire livelihood along with everything that he had spent the last 11 years building. Undeterred, Sid and Elizabeth opened another shop on the high street, a year to the day of the accident. This time, they opted to open up a coffee shop, which would also sell pottery and crafts. Originally, the building only contained the storefront. However, one day, convinced there was an area behind the back wall, Sid took a sledgehammer to the stonework, revealing the area that would soon be known as the coffee house, or, if you were a local, simply Sid's. Sid had begun to focus more on painting rather than pottery, and quickly built up a portfolio of several local views and buildings, showing a particular fondness for the basin. Most people recall past events from old photographs. Sid Walker recalls them from the painting he was working on at the time. In his exhibition, there are little reminders such as painted the day the second atom bomb was dropped. That particular painting of a fishing boat turned up after the title of the exhibition had been fixed, otherwise it would have been the first 40 years. Sid is one of the few artists in the country who paint full time, and exhibitions of his work have been staged in Europe and the United States. I asked him what his thoughts were as he gathered together 38 years of work. I don't think there were any solid thoughts in the beginning, but uh, as it began to grow, I realized that it was my life. And I was very surprised to find some of the paintings. As I told you, some of them were lost. And therefore, these that had came back after 30 years were 
quite staggering. When you say lost, what had happened to them? Um, they were in my brother's garden shed in Birmingham. Yeah, and they were rolled up and some of them were on the floor being trodden on. You became a full-time artist about 28 years ago. How precarious a living has it been? Very. Uh, there have been times when we've been looking for pennies because it's, uh, it has been quite difficult. Any regrets? No, no, no regrets uh, about doing this. If I had to look back and start all over again, I wouldn't like to start knowing what I've gone through. That may have stopped me, but I wouldn't like to be back into teaching, I know that. Sid was soon becoming a sought after for his design and illustration work as much as his painting, and he created many logos and magazine covers and contributed artwork to several publications throughout Scotland. One of his biggest commissions was to create a commemorative stamp for Montrose over the festive period, used on every letter that left the town, sending his work up and down the country daily. Sid also served as a lecturer for the Scottish Arts Council and would provide demonstrations of watercolour, pastel, acrylic and oil painting techniques to captive audiences. By the time the scheme finished in 1995, Sid was the longest serving lecturer. Never one to rest on his laurels, Sid moved on to his next venture, an ambitious idea to create an art centre that would not only serve as a studio and gallery, but would provide a hub for creatives in the town. Located down Queen's Close on Montrose High Street, Sid purchased and renovated an old horse's stables, creating what would soon be known as the Stables Art Centre. Once completed, it quickly became a hive of activity, as Sid regularly held exhibitions and events, whilst also creating original works of art. The Stables Arts Centre proved to be everything that Sid had hoped for. However, most importantly, it gave him a space to work on his most ambitious project ever, a project he'd been planning since 1954. Sid Walker, Montrose artist, uh, to tell us a little bit more about the Montrose experience, isn't it? Montrose Basin experience. I started the idea um, in 1954 <laughs> and uh, it's taken me quite a long time to produce. Uh, it's 62 foot long uh, in total with 10 panels and I've managed to get it to, into a 20 foot circle because we've been having problems with uh, spaces. Uh, I can remember taking Chris Hardy, the um, reporter, in with me and we got into the centre and it was quite hard going, you know, the ground. Um, and then uh, he went back to say, oh, I can get a good picture from here, and I heard this <laughs> and When I looked around, he'd gone nearly there over his Wellingtons. <laughs> I took some photographs, but then I went out uh, a number of times afterwards, um, taking video, uh, slides, prints, you know, um, all sorts of photographs, some with a wide angle, some with uh, close-up, just to get, uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of pictures. And uh, I've been using these uh, to do the painting. Well, it was, a, it was a very involved process to, to get them together. I, I got a, an ordnance survey map and drew onto it uh, to work out the panels, drew them onto it. Now, I know it's been in Old Kirk Hall. In that publicity. was actually for the, for the newspapers yes. and, for, and for me to see it, because up till then I hadn't seen anything other than separate panels. Mm -hmm. So I saw the whole length. Uh, Any other effects? Yes, yes, there'll be... Uh, the sounds of birds, geese, and uh, also the um, sort of texture underneath. And then the lighting as well will be able to uh, take you in the centre from dawn through to dusk. And you also will hear a train going over the bridge. And that is an actual steam train of Montrose. It's been very exhausting and I think that in, now I'm beginning to realise how exhausting it has been. Well, even when I saw it in the church hall, uh, I looked at it and <laughs> thought, heavens, um, if I'd known about this, I don't think I would have started right at that time. Yes. Rick was really the person who allowed me to do it. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth. <laughs> Sid, thanks so much. And thanks for your friendship over the days, and thanks for telling me and everybody listening to Ask FM about this uh, walk-in picture which is the cheap way of saying the Montrose Basin experience.
As Sid's reputation grew, he was invited to appear on the popular TV show The Beech Grove Garden, where he produced a painting of the titular garden during the course of the episode. Well, I, I'm using a, a viewer, and uh, this has been going since about 17th century, so it means that by holding it in front of me, I can view through it and compose. It's rather like a wide-angle lens. Well, I want to get something in the way of a, a blue for the sky, and I, I want something that's lighter, because I'm going to put that in first of all. You carry on, then. Yes. Just let me watch what you're doing. What do you think, folks, eh? Quite startling. Oh, really? Amazing. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. And it's signed there in the bottom. Perhaps the biggest accolade for Sid and his work came when he was named in the Queen's Honours List and awarded an MBE for services to the arts. Great, uh, really great. It's nice as well to come to Holyrood. It's the first time invested in the um, period, isn't it? You know, since the government has been in, in uh, Edinburgh. So that's good. After a long and successful career, Sid decided to spend less time in the gallery and more time with his family. He enjoyed taking several trips abroad with Elizabeth, often accompanying Kirsten, Fiona and their families on holiday, and still painted recreationally. Sadly, in his 90th year and after a long illness, Sid passed away on the 4th of July 2015, leaving behind a great legacy and a huge collection of original paintings, sketches and pottery which are still enjoyed to this day. Mm -hmm.